So um, thank you all. I was here at this time last year. I had a delightful time. And I can see we have a great turnout tonight, great turnout of students. I'm happy the two professors seriously twisted some arms. So we got a very good crowd. Um, I, I'd like to say just a few words about um, this collaboration between the museum and the local community college. It's, very, it's unique. I would love to see it emulated across the country as a historian. They, they do such a wonderful job. It's a labor of love, obviously. Uh, I hope you all realize just how lucky you are not to hear me talk tonight, but to have a program like that and to have people in the community who are so invested in the history of World War II. It's really a rare thing. So congratulations to the museum and to the community college for putting this on. Um, I was here at this time last year, as George said, talking about my book, The Ghost Mountain Boys. And George uh, told you a little bit about it, but The Ghost Mountain Boys is the story of 1,100 men from the 32nd Infantry Division who were ordered by General MacArthur to walk across the Papuan Peninsula of New Guinea. I don't know what you know about the Papuan Peninsula of New Guinea, but it is unmapped even today. It's some of the most rugged terrain on the planet. The men walked 130 miles th through fetid swamps and tangled jungles and over 12,000 foot mountains. They had dysentery, they had malaria, and when they got to the north coast, where they were sp supposed to unseat the Japanese, the Japanese Imperial Army, they were physically shattered by the experience. Men had lost a third of their body weight, and they were sent directly into battle. And the battle that was the first U.S. victory in the South Pacific. And I know we asked Stanley Ostromsky to raise his hand, but I'd like him to raise it again, because there is a man we should all thank. My 12-year-old daughter wanted to join me on this because Stanley still occasionally calls our house and leaves a message on the answering mach machine. And he says, this is Stan the Man Yastrzemski, J-A-S-T-R-Z-E-M-B-S-K-I. And my, my daughters have heard it enough that they chant along with him. They know how to spell the, his long Polish name. And my 12-year-old daughter wanted to come along just so she could meet Stan the Man Yastrzemski. So um, when, I, when I wrote, and forgive me if I'm being redundant. Some of you have heard this last year. I'll try to keep it mercifully brief. But to write the Ghost Mountain Boys, I made two trips to New Guinea, the second of which I took along a small documentary film crew and uh, a small expedition team. And we retraced the route of the Ghost Mountain Boys across the Papuan Peninsula. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. I used to be an adventure travel writer. I've been all over the world in very difficult circumstances, but this was the hardest thing I've ever done. I had malaria. We all had malaria. We had jungle rot. We had trench foot. We had infected cuts, and we, there were leeches all over the trail, just like there were in, in 1942. They would bite, and then the cuts would get infected in the 100-degree weather. And um, it took us 22 days to make, the, to make the trek, but we weren't trying to move 1,100 men, and we had everything working in our favor. And when we reached the, the north coast of the Papuan Peninsula, we got to swim in the ocean, and we got to sleep under clean sheets, and we got to drink beer, and we got to celebrate our achievement. And, and it was, again, the hardest thing I've ever done. When I finished that book, I vowed that I was going to do something lighthearted. I was physically exhausted by the experience. I'd been toying for years with doing a book um, about a tour of the country's microbreweries. And <laughs> it was going to be a takeoff on John Steinbeck's The Travels, Travels with Charlie. And I was going to call it, and I thought it was very imaginative, Travels with Barley. And, <laughs> I thought it was going to be a sure publishing success, but my publisher wasn't interested. So instead of writing about travels with barley, I wrote the most unlighthearted book of all, The Color of War. Um, I worked just as hard 
to write. I don't have the book with me. I, hold on, I'm going to grab it. This big fat book. Um, I worked for four years to write this book. I traveled all over the country. I traveled all over the South Pac Central Pacific. I went to Saipan. I went to Tinian. I went to Peleliu. I went to Palau. I went to Truk. So I was all over the Caroline Islands. And as I mentioned, my father-in-law is a money manager out of Chicago. And he pulled me aside at one point to, dis to dispense some essential financial wisdom. And um, it was like a scene out of The Graduate when that man takes Dustin Hoffman, puts his arm around his shoulder, and takes him out to the pool. And he says one word, plastics. Well, my father-in-law, who's always trying to give me again, trying to get me to change professions, took me, put, my, put his arm around my shoulder and talked to me a little bit about why, how I was spending so much money researching this book. And he said, I have two words for you, son-in-law, write faster. <laughs> so that was the financial wisdom he dispensed. And for better or worse, his wisdom fell on deaf ears. Um, as George said, I've always considered myself kind of a boots-on-the-ground author. Um, I don't believe that I ever would have been able to capture the heroin, her heroism and the suffering of the Ghost Mountain Boys had I not done the trek myself. My first book, which, which George mentioned, is about my cousin who lives uh, 130 miles north of the Arctic Circle and 100 miles from the nearest neighbor and I lived with him off and on for two years. And I don't believe that I could have written the, his story without having lived his life. So with this book, I tried to do the same thing. And I, I, hope, I've, I, I hope I've succeeded. Um, I go, I talk a lot at conferences, at book conferences across the United States. And there are always lots of young, dreamy-eyed writers in the audience, and they want to hear about the muse and the creative impulse and how you sit down and you write, you write like Jack Kerouac, you know, you write stream of consciousness stuff and they said, what's it really like? And I said, it ain't anything like that. I assure you, writing is hard work. I'm an early riser. I'm at my computer at 4, 4.30 every single morning. I have three daughters and I got to get there before all hell breaks loose because once that happens, I, I'm not able to write. So I write an hour and a half or two before they get up, and um, I always invite the muse, but usually the muse ditches me. It the muse, he or she, rarely, if ever, shows up. When he or she does, it's a great thing. And I always extend the invitation. I'll say, I'm there every morning. I hope you attend. But the muse usually doesn't. So I tell them that writing a book is like being a bricklayer. You get your brick, and you get your mortar, and you slowly start building a wall. And gradually, this wall starts to take shape. And occasionally, you might even step back and think, wow, this wall is kind of pretty. And when you finish the wall, you show the wall to your editor, and then your editor tells you to knock down half the wall. That's what writing a book is like. So, so it, it's, it's, it's hard, hard work. And this book, again, you know, not to, not to preach on it, but this book <laughs> took four years of my life, <laughs> took four years of my life. And um, the, the, what I've tried to do in this book is to meld or weave two very seemingly disparate stories. But as I researched the book and as I wrote it, I was astounded by the historical interconnections or intersections. Um, the first one is about the first narrative is about the battle for Saipan, which, in my opinion, was the critical battle of the Central Pacific. Uh, Donald, Donald Miller, the World War historian, calls it as essential to the victory over Japan as the Normandy invasion was to the victory over Germany. The second half, the second narrative, as George said, is about black America's battle for the right to fight. The military at the time was steeped in segregation, and black America and black Americans viewed their denial 
the denial of their right to fight for the country they loved as a symbol of their status as second-class Americans. And nothing, um, I believe, captures the reality of that, the, the heartbreak of that, and the pain of that, like what happened at the Port Chicago Naval Ammunition Depot. So this book is about the good war and the greatest generation. And by the way, I'm a believer in that mythology. I believe, I believe in that. I, I tended countless parades when I, was, when I was a kid, and I grew up to revere these men. But the good war had an ugly underbelly, and that was racism in America. So this book right here is about what I call the heroism and the heartbreak of the American, of the American experience during World War II. Um, people often ask me how I came to find out about Port Chicago, and it actually kind of began in New Guinea. On my first trip to New Guinea, I learned about a group called the 96 Engineers, which was an African-American engineering battalion which had been built wharfs and piers and roads and airstrips all across the island of New Guinea. So here I was on, on the island of New Guinea researching a forgotten story of the Ghost Mountain Boys, and I stumble in to this other forgotten story about the 96 engineers. And I came back and I went to the National Archives and I was researching my New Guinea book and I stayed for an extra day because I wanted to research the 96 engineers. And it turns out I couldn't find anything. The only thing I found was a book called Love War, Love War and the 96 Engineers, which was written by the white captain of the black engineering unit. He was a white southerner from New Orleans, but he was Jewish. So he had experienced some prejudice himself. So he, he wrote this book, and, and I, I found the book there, and it, it kind of intrigued me. So I spent another day trying to, trying to dig up black oral histories or written histories of their experience during World War II and it was few and far between. And I thought, this doesn't make sense. Macar General Douglas MacArthur called the war for the Pacific an engineer's war. And black Americans in, in World War II were largely engineer types. They worked for construction battalions and labor battalions. And the whole strategy for our Central Pacific campaign was overwhelming naval power, over, overwhelming naval power, followed by overwhelming power once we landed our troops. So it struck me as unusual that I knew nothing about the people that contributed to the combat supply line. So I vowed then and there that if I ever did another World War II book, I was going to somehow tell that story. And I decided to combine the two stories because, as I said, one story didn't seem to capture the truth entirely. And I wanted to capture the truth in its entirety. And it was both the heroism and the heartbreak of the American experience during World War II. So what I'll try to do is I'll just try to tell you a little bit about um, the first part of the narrative, the battle for Saipan, um, that battle, actually the entire, entire Central Pacific campaign never would have happened without the perseverance and the de de determination of Admiral Ernest King, who was the commander in chief of all naval operations. Um, Ernest King thought, Ernest King called the Central Pacific the Blue Water Highway to Japan. He believed that the easiest way, to, the, the, the way to get to J the J Japanese home islands without a tremendous loss of life was through the Central Pacific. He had a lot of detractors. Um, the, tr his, the detractors, his, his detractors called the Central Pacific Ernie King's beloved ocean. And the detractors, he had some in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Winston Churchill was a detractor. Churchill believed that anything that distracted America from Europe 
was, was bad. And his other detractor, his chief antagonist, was none other than General Douglas MacArthur, who unsurprisingly thought he should be the supreme commander of the entire Pacific campaign. So Ernest King and General Douglas MacArthur butted heads through this whole time, and eventually the Joint Chiefs of Staff recognized both campaigns, much, much to General MacArthur's disappointment. So MacArthur was going to lead the campaign through New Guinea and the Philippines and in the Southwest Pacific, and Ernest King would lead the campaign through the Central Pacific. And King believed, MacArthur thought it, would re it represented two weak thrusts. Admiral Ernest King called it the whipsaw plan, and he loved the dual campaign idea. He thought it would stretch the fuel-starved Japanese Navy to the breaking point, and he thought it would stretch their defenses, which were already overextended, to the breaking point. So when that happened, he was delighted. Uh, the central island in the, in, the, in the Central Pacific campaign was Saipan. Now, if you know anything about marine history during World War II, you know about Guadalcanal, you know about Iwo Jima, you know about Peleliu, but you don't know about Saipan. And as I said, I think Saipan was the central battle of the, of the Central Pacific, and Ernest King believed it was too. He, the, the, Saipan is about... 1,200 miles southeast of Japan and east of the Philippines is part of the Marianas chain, which is a, a chain of 14 volcanic islands. And Ernest King believed that if we could capture Saipan, we could threaten the, island, island, uh, the home islands of Japan with aircraft carriers, with long-range submarines, and with the B-29 bomber. Which, which had a range of 3,500 miles and could carry four tons of bombs. So he was absolutely adamant about capturing Saipan. When the, when the Joint Chiefs of Staff signed off on the campaign, they told him first he had to capture Tarawa, the Marshall Islands, and Truk in the Eastern Caroline Islands. And we did that in late 1943, late 1943 and early 1944. And then the invasion date for the island of Saipan was scheduled for June 15th of 1944. For three days, we pulverized the island with battleships and destroyers and airplanes. We strafed, we shelled, we bombed the island. And the general consensus was the Japanese would run. Well, they did anything but. Um, the Japanese strategy for defending the island of Saipan was to drive the American invasion force into the sea. The island is 12 and a half miles long and five and a half miles wide, and the Japanese had 34,000 Japanese Imperial Army troops on that small island, and they'd ringed the entire island with howitzers, mountain guns, anti-tank guns, machine gunners, and again, they were, they, their goal was to drive the Americans into the sea. The landing day did not come off as planned. It took three days to land the landing force, and on the third day, General Holland Howland Mad Smith, who was the commander of the invasion, of the land invasion, also brought in his reserve troops from the Army's 27th Division. Uh, it, took them, it took them 10 days to move three miles inland and one mile north, and casualties were quickly mounting. Uh, as in New Guinea, the men got malaria, they had trench foot, they had jungle rot, and they had infected coral cuts. But as the, battle, as the battle commenced, they moved through places like the Devil's Backbone and Death Valley, and they pushed north through the island of Saipan. And it took them three weeks to capture, to capture a place called Mount Tapachau, which is 16, a 1,600-foot 1, peak at the center of the island. So it took them three weeks to move six miles north. 
And on July 7th, when they captured Mount Tapachau, the commanding general of the Japanese Imperial Army re saw the handwriting on the wall. And he and his two advisors committed seppuku, but not before organizing the largest bonsai charge of the entire, of, of the entire war. On July 7th at 4 a.m., 5,000 Japanese Imperial Army troops rushed the American forces, the Marines and, and the soldiers from the U.S. Army. Two days later, African American burial details picked up 5,000 bodies. One of the combat correspondents, a guy named Robert Sherrod, who uh, filed combat correspondence for Time Magazine, said this wrote, this is the island of the dead. The dead are everywhere. This is worse than Tarawa. So one would think that the war, that the battle would have ended there, but it didn't. The Japanese Imperial Army was fighting to the, to the bitter end. It, it lasted 10 more days. The US Army pushed the Japanese what remained of the Japanese army north to a place called Marpy Point. And at the north end of the island, there are cliffs. There are huge cliffs, 300-foot cliffs, 600-foot cliffs, 800-foot cliffs. And those cliffs would eventually be called Banzai Cliff and Suicide Cliff. And this is where the Japanese soldiers jumped. And they jumped by the hundreds. Um, when the, command, the, the remaining commander on the island of Saipan notified on July 17th Tojo that they had lost the island of Saipan. Tojo in his entire cabinet resigned. And Hirohito, the emperor of Japan, was heard to say that hell is upon us. He knew what was coming. The island of Saipan is um, known for a number of firsts. It was the first time in World War II that black Americans, African Americans, were, were allowed to bear arms. And that's because of the fatalities on the first, second, and third day. General Howland Mad Smith, these were labor battalions and ammunition battalions that were unloading 6,000 tons of supplies and ordnance and ammunition, or they would, every single day. Howland Mad Smith took them and had them, brought them to the front. They had absolutely no combat training whatsoever, and they patched holes in the front lines. It's also the first time in World War II where um, Marines and U.S. soldiers came under Marine command. Um, General Howland Mad Smith extolled the inner service brother, brotherhood early on, but that brotherhood quickly disappeared when they realized that the U.S. Army and the Marines had very different fighting tactics. Um, it was also, as I, as I said before, not the first, but the second bonsai charge of the war. The first one was on Atu Island in the Aleutian Islands, but this was by far the biggest. It was a formal bonsai charge called, and I'm, and I'm trying to pronounce it phonetically, I'm not exactly sure how it's pronounced, a Gayakusai. And as I said, 5,000 soldiers, 5,000 Japanese soldiers rushed the American army. Um, it was also the first time that American troops had ever encountered Japanese civilians. And those civilians, like the Japanese soldiers, went north to Mount Marpy Point, and whole families, hundreds of people, jumped off the cliffs because they had heard that the American soldiers were devils and demons and that they would be mutilated. So it, it gave... It gave great pause to the American generals and admirals as they contemplated invading the home islands of Japan because they'd already seen these civilians commit suicide en masse and they worried that as they got closer to Japan that that would happen, that would happen regularly. So 
On on July 17th, um, off the coast of Jap Japan, off the coast, excuse me, of Saipan, Admirals Ernest King and Admiral Nimitz were celebrating the victory over the island within sight of the island of Saipan. At, and at 1019 that evening, the Port Chicago Naval Ammunition exploded with a force nearly that of the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. The Port Chicago, th 300 men died, 390 men were wounded, three quarters of them were African American seamen who, untrained African American seamen who were loading um, Liberty ships for the invasion that was going on in the Central Pacific. Had that explosion occurred, it, in, it occurred in the hold of one of the Liberty ships. Had that explosion occurred above the waterline and closer to major population centers, the, 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 the loss of death would have been incalculable. Uh, just, just to backtrack a little bit and tell you a little bit about Port Chicago. Port Chicago was established three days, the Port Chicago Naval Ammunition Depot was established three days after the Japanese invaded Pearl Harbor. Um, Henry Knox, who was the Secretary of the Navy, used the War Powers Act to seize 600 acres near Port Chicago, which, as George said, was just northeast of San Francisco and Oakland, just east of something called the Sassoon Bay on the Sacramento River. And as a location for an ammunition depot, it had a lot to recommend it. There were two transcontinental railroads that came through Port Chicago. Uh, it, was, it was isolated from major population centers and the Sacramento River was big enough to accommodate ocean-going ships. So the Port Chicago, the building of the Port Chicago Naval Ammunition Depot began immediately, fast and furious. And the ammunition, ammunition loaders began loading ships as early as the summer of 1942. And by the way, most of the ammunition load, actually all of the men loading the ammunition ships were from the naval program at Waukegan, Illinois, which at the Great Lakes Naval Training Center, which had just opened its doors to African-American recruits. And African-American recruits went there believing that they would be gunners and machinists and radio men, petty officers, and they were quickly disillusioned when they realized that they were being sent to the Port Chicago Naval Ammunition Depot, which many of them considered, uh, in, in a number of the men that I interviewed, called it a plantation. So the Port Chicago Naval Ammunition Depot, in the lead up to the Central Pacific War, quickly became anything but a sleepy little place. By the fall of 1943, it was the major, it was the neighbor, major shipping depot on the West Coast. The men were handling a colossal amount of ammunition. And as George said, much of this was considered hot cargo. Incendiary bombs, high, high explosives, torpex loaded bombs, and and fuses also, which they weren't allowed to mix, but at Port Chicago, they mixed with the bombs. The men were working 12-hour shifts, four divisions working 12-hour shifts. They were, loading the, they were loading a Liberty ship with 6,000 tons of ordnance in three days. They had no training manual. They had no training with ammunition. Their officers, many, many of them had very little training themselves. Yet, the commanding officer of Port Chicago, knowing that the troops in the Central Pacific and the Southwest Pacific desperately needed this ammunition, was pushing them or racing them. They were, he was racing divisions. So divisions were pitted against, the, against each other, and 
the commanding officers would hand out passes, 12-hour passes, 24-hour passes, to the men of the division that could load the fastest. So sloppiness, was in, sloppiness wasn't encouraged, but sloppiness was the eventual outcome of what happened. As I said, these men were loading for 12 hours a day. The co they had Coast Guard observers there, and the commanding officer of the Port Chicago Naval Ammunition Depot dismissed the Coast Guard observers. And the Coast Guard observers wrote a letter to the commanding general of the 12th Naval District under whose auspices Port Chicago fell and said that Port Chicago was a powder keg ready to blow. The African-American ammunition handlers wrote the San Francisco Chronicle, wrote the NAACP, and said the conditions here are deplorable. We have no chance for an advancement, and we're loading ammunition that we shouldn't be loading, and we are absolutely terrified. They, they predicted that it was going to blow, and as I said, ultimately it did on the, on the evening of July 17th. It exploded again with three-quarters of the force of the bomb dropped on Nagasaki. 150-mile-an-hour winds swept through Port Chicago. A third, there was a 30-mile, a 30-foot tidal wave on the Sacramento River. Seismographs at the University of California California Berkeley recorded two small earthquakes. The surviving seamen, black seamen, were taking wounded men, putting them on ambulances, were putting out fires. The fire threatened to spread to the revetment areas, which were holding bombs, and toward the other railroad cars, which were holding bombs. Had that, had that fire caught there, then we would have had a tragedy of truly epic proportions. Two days after the explosion and after the fires were gotten under control, Admiral Carl Carlton Wright, again, who administered the 12th Naval District, came to Mare Island on the other side of the Sacramento River to praise the black ammunition loaders. And he praised them for their heroism, under terrible circumstances for their bravery and also their contribution to the war effort in the Central Pacific. Then he proceeded to give the white officers three weeks survivor leaves, but the black ammunition loaders were given nothing. They were kept there because they were worried about rumors rumors circulating across the country. So the black ammunition loaders stayed there. In the meantime, they learned that Port Chicago would not be shut down, but it would be expanded. In the meantime, they also learned that um, Port Chicago, that, that Port Chicago, excuse me, <laughs> just had a momentary blank, um, that they would, oh, right, there would be there would be a, a court inquiry into the explosion. And eventually, the inquiry came back and did not fault the commander of the Port Chicago Naval Ammunition Depot, did not fault the officers, but laid the blame at the feet of the African-American ammunition loaders. They said that they were intellectually and emotionally incapable of handling high explosives. Three weeks after the explosion, what the men dreaded happened. They were marched down to the harbor and they were ordered to load again. Two, 208 men refused to load ships. They were promptly put in the brig. Two days later, Admiral Carlton Wright made another visit to Port Chicago. This time, he threatened the mutineers with execution. He said they would stand before a firing squad. Two, two, 152 of the men eventually agreed to load again. 50 of the men, the 
Port Chicago 50, as they would be talked about in the New York Times and the San Francisco Cisco Chronicle across the country, refused to load ammunition. Three weeks later, a mutiny trial began, the largest mutiny trial in U.S. history. The defense attorney said that though the, say, the, say, the black seamen might be guilty of insubordination, they were not guilty of mutiny because mutiny presumed a desire to overthrow, override, or subvert authority, and that was not their intention. The prosecuting attorney said that anything, including insubordination, indicated a conspiracy to overthrow the existing power. Three weeks after the trial began, Thurgood Marshall arrived. Thurgood Marshall, who would eventually become a Supreme Court Justice, was the chief counsel for the NAACP Legal and Educational Defense Fund, and he immediately put the Navy on trial in the newspapers. He said by initiating the mutiny charges, they heaped injustice upon tragedy. On October 24th, 1944, the courts martial deliberated for an hour and a half after a hundred, after, after um, a hundred witnesses, after 4,000 pages of documents, of which, by the way, I read every one, <laughs> um, dry as dust for most part, and um, after after hearing testimony uh, across the board from the ammunition, uh, ammunition loaders, the, the, the court decided that the men would be, were, were guilty. They were, given, they were given dishonorable discharges following 15 years of hard labor. So Thurgood Marshall continued to impress upon the Navy, but the entire armed forces, the injustice of this. Admiral uh, James Forrestal was the Secretary of the Navy at that time. Knox had died in April of 1944. And Thurgood Marshall prevailed upon him to desegregate the Navy, which he eventually did in December of 1944. Thurgood Marshall also asked at the, that time the Marines and the Army to desegregate. Um, the Army said that it was not a vessel for social experiments, and the Marine Commandant said that it would lower morale and hurt esprit de corps. Thurgood Marshall continued to prevail upon the military. When World War II ended, he convinced Forrestal to commute the sentences of the Port Chicago 50. They were released under honorable conditions. However, they would never receive veterans benefits and the felony conviction for mutiny was never erased from their records. And the men that I, that I interviewed said this haunted them for the rest of their lives. What, what continued after this, I'm going to sum up very quickly. It, it was a long, painful period between, 19, the end, between fall of 1945 and summer of 1948. But the black community threatened to boycott the draft. And as many of you know, in summer of 1948, President Truman integrated the entire military across the board. And that, that integration and inspired, 10 years later, Dr. Martin Luther King's Civil Rights Crusade. And if you read some of the papers of Dr. Martin Luther King, he points directly to 
the integration of the armed forces as one of his inspirations. So thank you very much. Thank you.